Okay, we're going to go through James chapter 4 and 5, hopefully, in this one video. And this will complete the James series of videos. Uh, this will be the third video. So, uh, here we go with James 4, 1. Alright. Submit. Okay, James 4, 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quar you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Okay. It's talking about uh, Christians in uh, dispersed Christians that he's writing to um, who do not live according to the law of God, the moral law of God in their life. And so as a result, um, they get into fights with people. There's a conflict of wills with other people. Uh, they want certain things. Uh, that other people have, and so they're they're even willing to kill and covet others for these things, and they they, they get into quarrels, that is arguments that uh, are intended on insulting people. Uh, this is different than uh, an argument be like through a theological debate where people might argue, or a philosophical debate where people might argue to gain perspective of the truth of a matter. This is quarreling, meaning people you know just arguing because they hate each other, arguing and insulting each other, and actually physically fighting one another. Um, sorry, I have an itch in my face. Um, you do not have because you do not ask God. So they, they do not pray, they do not pray to God for things, And uh, but even if they do pray to God, God does not answer their prayers because they do not live by the law of God, they do not live according to the moral standards of God. Um, and you know, 1 John says that if we, um, God will answer our prayers if we pray according to His will, and His will is, is expressed in His commandments. Okay. Um, and you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You know, how many, how many American Christians today caught up with the prosperity gospel and just caught up with the American dream mentality they pray for God to, to bless them so that they can uh, spend what they get on their pleasures. You know, it's all entertainment-driven prayers. Oh, Lord, bless me with a guitar. You know, oh, Lord, bless me with this car. Oh, Lord, bless me with, you know, a, you know good athletic ability so I can, you know, bl be the MVP of my team. These types of prayers are not even in accordance with the will of God. They're not even in accordance with the Bible, the commandments of God uh, at all. So God doesn't answer those kinds of prayers because God's not in it. See? 4 verse 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Now, remember in the first, the, the verse before that, he said that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Right? So, and you kill and covet. So, what is friendship with the world? It's materialism. Materialism, um, it's being, it's being, uh, uh, idolatry of pleasures and, and entertainment all the time. Uh, and that's hatred towards God. Okay? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That means, in other words, materialistic, pleasure-seeking. Now, it's not it's not wrong not to have fun, but as long as you have fun as a Christian, and that fun doesn't become more important to you than your minute-by-minute -minute walk with Jesus. Okay. What are you uniting yourself to? What what is the substance of your heart? You know, um, I have a loved one. And she is very much involved in the scene of art and uh, um, 
you know, artistic expression and, and, and things like this. And it's and that is a good thing. I mean, uh, God gave her an ability to be artistic. But uh, she has a sticker I saw. It was a terrible blasphemy of a sticker, and uh, and I know that it was blasphemy because she's she's rejected faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and the blas the blasphemy sticker says, "Art sanctifies." Jesus sanctifies. Uh, sanctifies means to be made holy. Okay. Um, art does not sanctify anything. Okay. That's total absurdity. That's like saying a popsicle sanctifies. My car sanctifies me. No, it does not. Friendship with the world is hatred toward God. James 4.4 4. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. God sanctifies. Jesus Christ sanctifies. His word, the Bible, sanctifies. His commandments, more than anything, sanctifies your life. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? Envies what? The Holy Spirit who lives in us envies what? He envies your life. He wants your life to be wholly given over to him. Entirely consecrated to God. Not a little bit. Not a little bit. Not a, not a little bit for 20 minutes on Sunday morning. All the time. Your whole life. That's, that's one thing that's, that's a word that's come up in this letter a lot. Life. Okay. 24-7. 24 hours a day. 7 days a week. Continuously walking in light of the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord over your life. Not just thinking about God a little bit during a 20-minute sermonette on Sunday morning, but, but having it day-to-day, hour-by-hour, minute-by-minute, second-by-second, walking relationship with God, with Jesus Christ. Four six, but he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, do you have demonic problems in your life? Are you haunted by ghosts at night time? Do you have nightmares? Do you have mental illness problems, evil voices, hallucinatory visions, evil visions? Do you have demonic oppression in your life? The answer is right here in James chapter 4, particularly verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? Firstly, you need to consecrate your life to God entirely. You need to not only have repented one time in your life, you need to be repenting every, virtually every second. I mean, not one, what I mean by saying that is not that you have to say, I repent, I repent, I repent every second. But your, your, your state of mind is a repentant mindset. Your, your entire consciousness is... is conscientiously before God, God, you know, if I sin, I'm going to repent to you right away, because my relationship with God is based on me loving God and repenting when I sin and doing what He tells me, because I love Him, out of love for Him, and out of fear of judgment that I so righteously deserve if I walk outside of His standards. Okay? So you need to submit yourselves to God, submit yourselves to the law of God. Submit yourself to the commandments, the righteous commandments of God. Okay? Then, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Command the devil, just as Jesus and the apostles did in the Gospels and the book of Acts. Command that spirit, that dream, that voice, that vision, whatever it is. Go away in the name of Jesus. Okay? Go away in Jesus' name. Or just simply say, Jesus. Okay. Because that is the name above every name, and every knee shall bow to that name.
and he will flee from you. The devil will flee, flee from you. James 4 8. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Our actions that we do with our hands need to be clean and righteous and pure before God. Our hearts, what we feel, our feelings, and our thoughts in our mind must be pure before God. It can only be cleansed by the, by the Bible, by the commandments of God. The righteous commandments of God that we need to obey in our life. Just a moment. James 4.9 Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. You know, this verse is so powerful in light of the fact that uh, so many charismatic Christians today which claim to have freedom in the Spirit are so given over to this positive thinking philosophy. Um, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, and all this stuff. Look, man. Now, in application to Christians that are being sinful, this is what James has to say to them. James 4, verse 9 and 10. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. You cannot have true joy and laughter before God, before the Lord, unless you are living a righteous life. What I mean by righteous life is not a perfect life, but a uh, pressing forward and a, a conscientious effort to live according to God's law. Uh, are you a good citizen of the United States? Do you keep the laws of the land? I would hope so. If not, you should be put in prison. Then, before the Lord, be a good citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Okay. The only way you're going to be at peace with the judge of all the earth is by living according to that judge's laws. Okay. Be a good law-abiding Christian. Then, afterwards, you will not have to be so sad. The sadness must come, though. The weeping and the repentance must come. If you are not living righteously, and you're just going to sit there with your holy laughter and your positive thinking, telling yourself that everything's about being happy, happy, happy all the time. Are you having fun? <laughs> are you having a nice day? Are you having fun? This is a frequent American Christian question. Are you having fun today? It doesn't matter. Are you living righteous? And if you are, that will give you joy from the Holy Spirit. Okay. There's a verse that just popped into my mind. I forget where it is. Uh... The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness is the first thing that is mentioned, and then joy and peace. You cannot have joy and peace without righteousness. Okay. Righteousness comes from the law, the moral commandments of the Bible. James 4.11 Brothers, do not slander one another. That means, do not speak lies about other Christians in order to defame their reputation when you know that there's no truth to it. 
Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. Now, it's not talking about judging according to the law. It's talking about those who judge by speaking against the law. In other words, using your own personal opinions and standards to judge other people. Like, uh, they've got a, they don't have a KJV Bible like I do. Uh, they don't wear their hair like I do. They don't have the same accent that I do. They don't like the kind of music that I do. That's, that's judging. And James says, anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it. In other words, but you are sitting in judgment of it. See, in other words, and so many people, when they quote verses like this, they, they don't realize the context that God is talking about keeping the law of God. But people actually try to become antinomian and take judging out of Christians' lives. And see, look, where there is a law, there is a judge. Where there are commandments, there are judges. And um, God has appointed judges in Zion. That's the Christians. Um, we will judge angels. And so, um, why? Because the law of God is written on our hearts and minds. But this is talking about people who are unrighteous and are judging not according to the law of God, judging according to their own personal opinions and traditions, and are actually contradicting the law of God by the things that they say. Sitting in judgment of the very law of God by their own opinions and standards. This would be um, this would be the liberal Christians, for example, who have a personal opinion that it is okay to be a gay Christian. That's their personal opinion. And they are sitting in judgment of the law of God when they judge conservative Christians for saying that conservative Christians are evil for saying that uh, homosexuals are in sin. That, that, those liberal Christians that judge fundamentalists for, for um, maintaining that homosexuality is a sin according to scripture, those liberals are judging the law, they are not keeping it, and they are sitting in judgment on it. That's what they're doing when they do that. James 4.12, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? In other words, outside of the law of God. Who are you, liberal Christian, to judge your fundamentalist neighbor in telling him that he's evil for believing that homosexuals need to repent and get right with God? Who are you to uh, just totally throw outside the counsel of God? And you'll also find that these are the people that don't believe the Apostle Paul was inspired by God, you know, and they pick and choose from the Bible, cafeteria Christianity, pick and choose religion, they just, they, just, uh, they don't believe in the Bible, they're all going to hell. Look man, if you don't believe all the Bible, you're not saved. Okay. James 4.13, now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. You know, most Christians today, first off, do not know that God speaks through dreams and visions and the voice of God today. That is sad. 
there is another group of Christians that do do know that God does this, but they don't uh, hearken to the voice of the Lord. They don't listen. They maintain that they're just going to do what they want to do. But instead, they ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that. Don't just up and go, hey, we're going to go to Chicago, and I'm going to make a bunch of money there. Did God tell you to go there? How does God? How do you know God's blessing is not going to be on your life? How do you know if God's blessing is going to be on your life? If you don't even, you know, you're not even willing to be guided by dreams and visions about, about major decisions. Everything's just rationalism with you. Your own ingenuity and intellect. That is like living your entire life without God. Like an atheist. Chapter 5, one, verse 1. Now listen, you rich people. So he's, he's really, he's talking about rich, carnal Christians who pride themselves in their own ingenuity. Don't give God really very much thought in their daily life and circumstances. James 5, one. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. James 5.7 Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. If you know, what, um, if you know about the book of Job, when he's saying you have seen what the Lord finally brought about, he's referring to the last chapter of the book of Job, where it says that Job was twice as wealthy that he was before all his trials and tribulations came upon his life. God blessed him. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. James 5.12 Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth, or by anything else. Let your yes be yes, and your no, no, or you will be condemned. Uh, the true brother of Jesus. Uh, he's quoting the very teaching of his brother right here. James 5.13 Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Look. 
James 14 and 15. I want us to, oh, I'm sorry, James chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. I want us to take a real good, close look at that. James chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. Okay. That's God's way of miraculously healing the sick. Yep. It's right there. The question is posited, is any one of you sick? And the answer is given call the elders of the church to pray over you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well that's the answer do you want to know how to heal the sick it is simply pray in the name of Jesus for that person to be healed that is the way that is the way and it says pray over him which means lay your hand on him and hover over him. Okay. And the presence of the Holy Spirit in you will transfer into him. The power of the Lord will come out of you and into that man. Okay. So there should be some physical contact going on here. Pray over him. Laying on of hands. Not this uh, phone hotline stuff. Now, granted, I believe people can get healed on phone hotlines. Jesus healed at a distance. The uh, the servant of the um, centurion. He said, "Go, your servant is well." Um, I could see a phone hotline type of a uh, thing going on there, but do not really step outside of the bounds of this. This is the the, the prescription, and this is how divine healing was. Uh, practiced in the faith cure days in the 1800s and then leading up to the early 1900s during the Pentecostal movement. This is how they believed healing was effective and they got many healings this way. When healing did not come, when miraculous healing did not come into the bodies of those that were prayed for, they simply continued to believe the scripture and continued to pray for the healing until something happened. Um, the healing may come as something small, like pain relief. It may come as something uh, like the removal of a cold. Or it may come as something very powerful, like the healing of blindness, the creation of a new organ in the body, or of a new body part, or of the extending of an uh, uneven leg. Supernatural healing has all sorts of, divine healing has all sorts of uh, levels of faith and power, and all sorts of levels of miracles, but it's all based on the prayer of a righteous man, okay? So, uh, if you're sick, and you want, and uh, the doctors can't help you, you need to firstly look for a righteous man, and secondly, that righteous man needs to be willing to pray for your healing by the laying on of hands. And preferably, that righteous man who is willing to pray for your healing needs to should have some prior experience in healing other people. Um, if you discern that this man is not righteous, if you discern that he's only willing to pray a prayer one time for you, is not willing to pray as perseveringly as he needs. Okay. So, uh, Elijah prayed perseveringly for the rain to come back. Okay. Then do not go to these, do not waste your time on these wannabe healers. Real healing. is going to come from someone who believes and practices holiness in their life and they are willing to pray for your healing, command the healing in the name of Jesus perseveringly, persistently 
and uh, they're not just going to give up and give you a cute little word of faith Bible verse, go with God. No, they're willing to pray through with you until you get something to happen to your body. Okay, that's a real divine healer. And so when it makes reference, James 5.18, in reference to Elijah, the righteous man, again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, that comes out of 1 Kings 18, 41-45. And you may know that Elijah prayed something like three or more times until the rain came. So uh, Elijah didn't just pray a prayer one time and all of a sudden it rained. He prayed multiple times and then the rain came. So Elijah even didn't have perfect faith. Okay, We think of the perfect prophet and we think, oh, you know, Elijah, he's the perfect prophet. But not even Elijah had perfect faith. He was a man just like us. But he was a righteous man. And he was powerful, effective in his prayers. James 5.19 and 20 would conclude our letter our, of James. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the end of the book of James. Now look here. When he says, wander from the truth, and then he, he's talking about, he's talking about sins, a, li a sinful way of living, the error of his way, his way of life, uh, a sinner, okay? There's only one way to really know the truth, that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and that is by living righteously according to the law of God that has been given to us in the Bible. When you get away, when you wander from the truth, you wander from the law. When you wander from the righteous way, you, you fall into a sinful way of living. So, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins so that we can be forgiven our sins from the past. And press onward toward the future living according to the righteous moral law of God. Now God knows that we all stumble and he's willing to help us with his grace and mercy along the way. But don't ever allow yourself to be deceived into thinking that you are saved if you are not living if you are not living a righteous life According to the principles, laws, and commandments of the Bible, you are not saved. Those who are saved are conscientiously living in a state of consciousness where they are living according to the law of God. Okay, Their life is the law of God. The law of God is their religion. Okay? Their relationship with God comes through the law of God by faith in Jesus Christ and with a definite, immediate experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Enabling repentance, enabling faith, and enabling righteous living. Not perfectly, we all stumble. But there's a pressing onward towards perfection. This is the Christian life. And uh, so, any Southern Baptist, I, I'm picking on them because they pick on us as legalists. They pick on Arminians. Any Southern Baptist would say no. They would contradict what I'm saying completely. No, you don't have to live a righteous life. They would say, you, you, you just, uh, you just, uh, all you have to do is pray a prayer. Say, God, you know, come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins. I'm saved. Quick magic formula. So you can just continue living however you want to live. No real change of your heart. No real change of your life. Look, man. James 1, 
22 describes that, that lazy bad Baptist. Do not merely listen to the world, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says, James 1, 22. These people have deceived themselves. They only listen to the word, but they do not do what it says. They think faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. They do not do what it says. Woe to them. May they repent and become Arminians. And practice daily the law of God in their life, as James says over and over. And uh, I hope and I pray that this, uh, this series of videos on James will help, maybe, to turn a sinner from the error of his way and save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Thank you very much. God bless you. Amen.